A little bit of background uh, on me, as uh, Christine mentioned, uh, I started about 20 plus years ago looking at the internet and trying to predict where it was going to go. Uh, and in the course of since then, I've been working on digital transformation with um, companies large and small across many industries. And what I want to share with you today is kind of the culmination of, um, of what I've learned over those years um, and give you a preview of the workshop that we'll be holding uh, in a few weeks. Um, and really what I want to focus on is kind of three things. Um, one is what I find consistently coming up for executives and leaders is, first, how can we see the future more clearly? With things changing so rapidly, it's hard to, to see even a few months um, into the future, let alone uh, a few years to kind of do our planning. So I want to help you see the underlying trends to see the future more clearly. I also want to help you understand how you can seize be better opportunities and bigger opportunities. You know, the incremental, the tactical is always uh, right available to us, but how do we think about bigger opportunities? And along with that, how can we let go of the past? Um, this is as much as anything the challenge today is, is that we've been doing things a certain way for so long and we need to find new ways, which means letting go of the old ways. Now, I would say my first major epiphany was back when I was working on my PhD, looking at the internet and realizing that it really was a fundamentally new medium that was going to change everything we think about organization, society, value creation. But I would say my second epiphany came about six years ago when I started shift thinking and I realized that all of my work on transformation was focusing on what people should do differently. You know, I was looking at the best practices and that whole model and that instead, what we have to do is start with how we think. And that to transform what we do, we first have to transform how we think. And you can see the missing piece here because just think about how many meetings you're in where an issue comes up and everyone starts talking about what to do differently. And how often do you actually stop and ask yourself, well, how should we be thinking about this problem? And what I wanna give you for the next 20 minutes or so are some new ways of thinking. We'll go into more depth at the workshop, but at least give you an overview of what I mean by a new way of thinking. And when you think about these approaches, I want you to look at it through the lens of unlearning. So it's not just information that you're going to add to what you already know, but instead, it's really a new mental model that requires um, rethinking the way you've already done things. And you can think about that like, uh, depending on what country, um, uh, where you are, you know, if you came to the US, or when um, this was a picture I took in London when I went there, you know, when you drive on the other side of the road, it's as much about unlearning the way you're familiar with as it is about learning the new way. And that's really the, the world we're in now. It's kind of as if things got flipped around. And one of the key shifts here is moving from the incremental to the exponential. And digital transformation starts with some kind of exponential technology but then what happens is, is we put incremental thinking on top of that technology. And when you do that, you get incremental results. And instead what we need is exponential thinking. And that's what gives us the exponential results. And I can prove this to you um, by looking at Wikipedia. And most, uh, you probably, you all know Wikipedia, you probably don't know what Wikipedia was before it was Wikipedia. And I don't mean Encyclopedia Britannica or Encarta or something like that. So Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, had something called Newpedia. And you can see here that it was an, a peer-reviewed free encyclopedia with open content, free for anyone to use, that accepted articles um, from others. So what was the difference between Newpedia and Wikipedia, other than a better logo and a better name? Well. The key difference was that Newpedia had a seven step approval process. People would send in articles and the editors of Newpedia would review those articles. And the problem was is that it took so long for them to agree on the edits that they only approved 21 articles in the first year. And that's when they realized that not only did they need to use this new technology, but they needed to create a new kind of thinking about how to produce an encyclopedia and they opened it to the community. They turned the readers not only into authors, but into editors, and they created a set of principles with a shared purpose that enabled them to create Wikipedia, and there were 18,000 articles posted in its first year. 
So it was the new thinking on top of the new technology that really enabled them to create the exponential change. Now, as we think about transformation, my experience is that resistance is uh, that change. We often think about people being resistant to change. And the resistance is not as bad as you think it is. So when you go into a change effort, you always expect resistance. But what I will tell you is, is that if you focus on changing the thinking, the resistance to the doing is much less. And the reason is that we hang on to old models until new ones appear within reach. So imagine that you're hanging from a trapeze bar, the rope is fraying and there's no net below. You will hang on to that trapeze bar as long as you can until there's a new one that appears within reach. And when there is, you'll gladly move to it. But telling people that the rope is fraying and they need to jump isn't effective until they have that new bar. And that new bar is a new way of thinking, not just something new to do. Now you can see the power of exponential change and our unfamiliarity with discontinuity in these two pictures. So this is a picture from 1900 and it's all horse-drawn carriages with one automobile. Now 1913, only 13 years later, same area and you have all cars and one horse. And our minds just aren't prepared for this kind of discontinuity. So we saw the World Wide Web had this kind of effect. Look at what's happened with newspapers. Um, you can see uh, we're about to go into a whole change around digital biology and the way in which we create health. And in each of your industries, you can think about the discontinuities that have reshaped that and our difficulty of forecasting a discontinuity. So we assume that the world is linear, but we're living in an exponential age. And we need the new kind of thinking because the way in which we thought about strategy and growth and loyalty and engagement and communication and management all assume linearity. And you know, in the workshop, we're gonna go into this in a lot more depth of what that means to be exponential, but I wanna give you a flavor for what the new ways of thinking are. So one of the things to think about is a 10% world versus a 10x world. So in a 10% world, you're, you focus on being what I would call an incremental leader, where you're trying to deliver incremental results to make things 10% better, 10% cheaper, 10% um, more productive, 10% growth. But an exponential leader delivers exponential results. And at Singularity University, this really is our focus, is how do we help leaders and organizations adapt and evolve in a world of accelerating change. That's the nature of the exponential, is an accelerating change produced by a network effect of some kind. And in that exponential path, you have to understand that the nature of innovation is different and the path of innovation is different when you're working on the linear versus the, uh, the exponential. So a linear model, an incremental model is where things move consistently over time. So the 10% change, uh, you can see the destination of for where you're going and the rate of change is constant. But an exponential change is quite different. You can see here the accelerating rate of change. And that's what was the automobile relative to the horse, for example. And we can see all of the digital technologies that we're now facing are all have that exponential quality, whether it was um, mobility and the rise of the smartphone, the World Wide Web, what we're seeing now with analytics and AI and the Internet of Things and digital biology, all of them have this exponential quality. Now we'll go into this more at the workshop, but there are four gaps that you have to overcome in order to succeed in this exponential journey. There's the vision gap at the beginning, which is how do you move towards uh, a direction where you're not clear yet on the destination, the expectations gap because exponential change happens more slowly, the accountability gap where you need entirely new kinds of metrics that rather than charting progress towards a predefined goal, instead you're working on designing metrics that tell you whether or not the network effect is kicking in, and the resource gap that enables you to resource something exponentially and not just incrementally. How do you line those up in advance? 
The other aspect of this exponential journey is how do you relate the core to the edge? How do you start something new and how does that relate to what you're already doing? How do you have the, the, the new not cannibalize the old? How do you have the core support the edge but not interfere with it? And there are varying views on this. Um, uh, my colleague here at, uh, at Singularity, John Hagel, has a view that you need to really separate the edge completely from the core. I have the view that you actually have to create a symbiotic relationship between the two. And we'll go into that more at the workshop as well. But the main thing to think about is, is in this exponential journey, how do you manage these four gaps? And how do you design the core and the edge to work together uh, effectively? Another aspect of this is, as you manage this journey, you really have to rethink leadership as well. So we normally think about leadership as being about the qualities of the person. How do I improve my skills, my knowledge? But it, it also needs to be about the role on the team. If you think about kind of how geese fly, right? You have a goose in the, in the front um, and it rotates and the other birds follow that goose. And so you wanna think about your role as a team leader for sure. And this is where our existing models of leadership stop. But in this exponential world, in this network world, you wanna think about it more like a flock where your job is to create the properties of the system so that everyone is a leader. And that's a very different way of thinking about leadership as opposed to people following you. It's about enabling the whole system to be effective. And the way to do that is to shift your thinking from focusing on the product and the process to instead focusing on the purpose and the principles and designing that shared purpose that all of the, the birds in the flock, if you will, that all of your employees and all of your stakeholders can flock around and the principles that enable them to make effective decisions in a way that's distributed as opposed to centralized in the traditional approach that focuses more on product, process, authority, and the hierarchy. And this shared purpose, the word purpose is being used a lot today. And what you wanna think about is not just the purpose that you deliver to your customer or provide the value you provide for your customer, but what is it that you co-create with your customer? That's the shared purpose that you all have together. And that's what enables that flock to be effective. And you can think about this as what I call the t-shirt test of is your mission my mission too? Who gets to wear the shirt? Is it just your investors? Is it your employees? Or do you also share it with your customers and your partners? Because when they own your mission, that enables an entirely new opportunity for value creation because they're not just the recipients of something, they're the participants in something. And you can think about the metrics that would use to evaluate how well you're not just delivering your purpose to and for, but that purpose with. We'll do an exercise at the workshop where you're able to really distinguish this for yourself. You also want it to trace back to your brand DNA, and this is a way that you align the core with the edge. You wanna be sure that that edge is still consistent with the DNA of who you are that doesn't change. And going back to your founder's story and the problem that the company was originally designed to, to solve is a great way of figuring out what that DNA is and aligning that with the shared purpose. So I wanna um, kind of uh, take a look here at a few of the multipliers and then we're gonna open it up for, uh, for some questions because these are the kind of the levers that you pull as an exponential leader in order to be effective, in order to create value. Um, the first is a platform. Uh, how you create 10x growth is by creating a platform mindset that connects supply and demand and enables others to create value. The use of a network accelerates speed by connecting resources and insight. The, a sense of community, not just an audience, but connecting to create peer exchange creates more engagement. You can, in effect, see the Wikipedia example in all of these cases already of moving from just a process to produce an online encyclopedia to a platform to engage a network of authors, readers, and editors as a community that created a kind of orbit, which I'll talk about in a moment, with having a narrative 
of how that purpose is fulfilled and the doctrine or the principles that empower decision making. So I'm gonna go through quickly over the next five minutes or so, just each of these as a, as a preview. And uh, as Christine said, we'll be covering these at the workshop and there's also more on, on the website. I'll give you the link for it at the end. So very quickly around platforms, it's really about a different way of thinking. So the pipe model is the old trapeze bar. We think about how we deliver value to others. Supply chain, that whole way of thinking is a one-way linear model. Whereas a platform mindset is really about enabling others to create value. And so instead of just focusing on consumers, you're focusing on co-creators. And this was one of the key shifts for Wikipedia was moving from the pipe model of encyclopedia creation to a platform model. Now the orbit idea is about disrupting the push mindset, the old trapeze bar of marketing and engagement, and you can see the linear thinking in the words that we tend to use here. So we segment the audience, we target them, we run campaigns, we move them through funnels, all very one way and linear. Here. And even the idea of customer centric is about hitting this bullseye more accurately. Instead, we want to think not about a push model in which we build, uh, build relationships to drive transactions, but instead a pull model where we embed the transactions inside the relationships. And we can think about this as this idea of a brand orbit where you have a shared purpose and you're pulling in all of your stakeholders into that orbit. And we've seen this by Apple, Google, Amazon in the beginning, but now you know, retailers like um, Sephora are doing this very well. Um, and increasingly what we see is not just a marketing campaign to push a message to drive the transaction, but an ongoing relationship that goes beyond the individual transactions. And particularly for any of you that are, whether you're in a retail or even in a B2B, um, the more that you can create that ongoing relationship where every interaction isn't monetized, it's that some of them are, and some of them are delivered by you or your partners to fulfill on that purpose. Two other, the last two multipliers, uh, and then hopefully um, you're uh, posing some questions in the chat, uh, is this idea of strategic narrative. This disrupts the existing, I call it the Hollywood model, of storytelling, which is kind of this product or company as the hero in a hero's journey. Uh, instead, what we want is um, a narrative that does more than just say why uh, they should buy something from you, but it explains why they should have a relationship with you. And it's not just about the benefits that you get from a purchase, but a sense of identity of who that person will be if they have that relationship with you. This needs to go along with the platform and network in orbit and again, we saw this with uh, Wikipedia, where you weren't just a reader or even an author, but an editor as well. So there was a shift in identity there. And then lastly, this idea of decision principles or what the military calls doctrine, which is really designed to transcending this trade-off between alignment and autonomy. So normally today, we either have the alignment of the hierarchy that gets everyone to operate with consistency or we have autonomy in which we can give everyone a decentralized distributed um, decision making, but there's no alignment and people kind of go all over the place. And so people are really concerned with being either too rigid and not agile enough on one side, but then being chaotic um, by being too autonomous or decentralized. And so what doctrine does, these decision principles, and uh, Wikipedia uses this, I'll show you in a moment, Google is very effective in this and increasingly companies are using this as a way to foster agility is that you have your mission goals and strategy which tell you where to go. You have your rules, policies and procedures which tell you what to do, but the doctrine takes the place in effect of management and it tells you how to decide. So instead of having to escalate the decision to the boss to make the decision, the doctrine empowers people to make the decision on their own. And we could see this with Wikipedia. These are the five principles or pillars that Wikipedia use in order to enable their community to flock effectively. And I'll just point out the fifth one that Wikipedia does not have firm rules is specifically designed to prevent it from collapsing into a kind of 
process and procedure or policy, but instead this is something that is collectively co-created by the uh, created by the community. So I'm going to pause there um, for a moment. We'll see what questions we have. Um, if we don't have questions, there are a couple other things I can cover. But uh, uh, Christine, what have uh, what have we got? Oh, I can't hear you. I don't know if everyone else can hear Christine, but uh, I can. So is that, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, so at the moment, um, so some of the questions, they're not coming through at the moment, so we do encourage people to ask questions. I think probably there's a lot of content there that you've just given us that everyone's getting their hair out. Yep. One of the things that I'd like to ask though is that when you were talking about how you embed uh, in transactions, you. Uh, you embed the transaction within the relationship and then you said something about how it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a monetary transaction. What are some of the other ways that you could embed a transaction in a relationship and it not be monetary? Well, if you think about uh, I'll start with a lot of the technology companies that I think pioneered this model. So, you know, how much do you pay for your Google search subscription? Right? Right? You don't. Um, what does uh, Apple charge for its Genius Bar? What is Amazon charging for um, use of Alexa on the devices? So the technology companies have kind of figured out how you create all these different interactions, and then there are certain, certain of those are monetized. Um, now, most of us aren't running software companies. Uh, so other examples of this, one of my favorites I mentioned is Sephora. So they have a shared purpose around what they call beauty together. And what they've done very effectively is that although they monetize the sale of cosmetics, it's really about everything that goes into a shared purpose of what it's required for people to create beauty, not just use the cosmetics. And so they have all sorts of things that range from classes and instruction and videos on how to apply um, makeup um, they have uh, online communities where they enable people to share with each other tips on how to use um, the makeup and how they create certain looks. They've designed technology that enables you to see how the makeup will look in an augmented reality through a mobile app that measures the color of your skin. So there's a whole set of things that they do that are then monetized with the sale. Okay, now Mark, um, Mark has come forward, Mark Roach, saying, can you give some examples of how it works in a B2B environment? Yeah, so in a B2B environment, um, it actually, uh, I developed a kind of the Orbit idea when I was working with some B2B companies, because when you have um, a, a particularly a large sale where there are multiple stakeholders in the company that have to sign off on it, you know, uh, typically in a B2B setting, it's not just a single buyer. There, are, there may be one decision maker, but there are a lot of people who have to weigh in. So one of the things that we did was we looked at what is it that could be done, could be provided to those other stakeholders that would enable them to help make the decision. So one of those things um, that we did was this was uh, for a technology sale. So they were targeting the CIO. But what they did is, is they started to create tools that the CFO could use. So they weren't selling things to the CFO. Indirectly, they were. But what they were, in effect, selling was understanding. So they would create tools about how to evaluate a technology purchase that could be used for any technology purchase, not just theirs. Another one is when you look at kind of what constitutes thought leadership, too often it just becomes kind of the the white papers that are too clearly pushing the product as opposed to creating something that might test, I call it intrinsic value. Is it useful to people whether or not they buy your product? That's a way to create that orbit that pulls people in because they get to know you and what you stand for and what you're about before they choose um, the product. So B2B tends to be these kind of tools, intrinsic value, relational ways in which you can demonstrate your value before you sell the product. 
Wonderful. Thanks very much for that, Mark. That's really helpful. Uh, so we're not getting any more questions. Did you want to mention anything before we wound up the webinar? Um, well, I just... Uh, uh, I think I just would, um, I would say that, uh, I don't know that we have time to go into the, the next piece. I'll save that for the workshop. Um, what I would say is, is that uh, kind of a little homework assignment I'll give to people is, um, I know I've covered a lot of ground. One of the things that I would say to start with on this is, think about your unlearning agenda. As you start to go through kind of over the next week, um, just be in meetings and start to listen for where do people rush directly into what are we going to do? Where is it that you can tell that people kind of know that whatever it is they're proposing isn't quite enough, but they don't know what else to do? And where is it that there needs to be some unlearning where you can realize that the rope is fraying in effect? Where is it that in your business today, you are operating from a pipe mindset, which is, we have a product, we're gonna go out and find the audience, we're gonna find a way to persuade them to buy it, and then we're gonna start over again and create loyalty as that kind of repeat transaction. Where is it that we're focused on um, you know, de distributing decision-making by granting authority to people, but they don't really have enough context to make effective decisions? Those are some areas that you can find your unlearning agenda, which is, what would it mean if we were about empowering others to create value, where we were empowering others to make decisions, where we were creating these connections between customers or between partners or between stakeholders, and just think where your existing business is operating more like Newpedia as opposed to Wikipedia, and what would a shift in thinking mean that would enable you to create value more exponentially? So I would just say to kind of just, it's one of these things where you'll be sitting in a meeting and something will catch you where you realize, wait a minute, I think that's what Mark was talking about. So hopefully that'll be a useful exercise for you.